So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our senior local government leadership webinar series hosted by Zen City. Today we are focusing specifically on going digital, meaning we're going to talk about how COVID-19 changed city events, operations, and crisis management, and what opportunities it has presented. So my name is Uri Mahler, and I am a customer success manager here at Zen City, meaning I work closely with our various local government partners. I'm honored to have with me today three guests from our three partner cities, uh, three of our partner cities from Florida. So from Pompano Beach, we have Tara Sparrow, who is a social media strategist for the city of Pompano Beach. She's the co-founder and CEO of Real Time Marketing Group, which is a digital media agency that works with several cities across Florida and other places. We have from Sanford, Edwin Poole, who is a performance management coordinator, and he uh, joined the city at the end of 2019. And prior to that, he spent uh, several years in different positions at Microsoft, managing and dealing with training and performance management of leadership, sales technicians, and logistics teams. And from Tamarack, we have our most experienced uh, public uh, servant, which is Michael Cernich, who is a city manager, and he's been the city manager of Tamarack since 2011. Prior to that, he served in uh, several roles in the city, and prior to that, he was a city manager of Shavano Park in Texas. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Michael was also the president of the Florida City and County Management Association in 2018 and the former vice president of the Texas City Management Association. So great guests, and I think they can make a very uh, interesting variety of point of views because each of them has uh, their own perspective. So they're going to share some of their main challenges and success stories throughout the COVID-19 crisis. But the idea for today is not just to have a presentation, but more of a conversation. So please feel free to ask questions, uh, you in the audience, and talk about what your local government is doing that is interesting in the chat option, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so if any, uh, just to get the ball rolling, if you could just type uh, where you're from and what is the main challenge you're currently dealing with in your city in light of reopening. Uh, and we, if there's questions that come up along the way, uh, we'll give time to uh, bring up those questions and have our panelists answer. So our agenda for today is I'll give a brief introduction to Zen City for those of you who don't know it. Uh, then we'll go to uh, Tara, who will talk about the shifts in public events, open spaces, and tourism. Then Michael, who will talk about rethinking city operations and crisis management. And Edwin, who will talk about leveraging the crisis to move to the dig digital era and staying there. And then we'll open up to questions and answers. So before we start, I'll give a quick intro about Zen City for those of you who don't know. We are a software and service solution for local government agencies to collect and analyze resident feedback. So today we work with over 140 local governments across four countries with the vast majority of them coming from the US and Canada. And our solution applies artificial intelligence and advanced algorithms to analyze high volumes of resident discourse in real time from a multitude of public social media and news sources. This allows local governments to quickly identify residents' top concerns, understand resident sentiment, and inform senior decision makers. Now, working with this wide variety of local governments, we know you all have some of the hardest jobs out there and are in constant challenge of prioritizing. Resources are limited, needs are various, and deciding on what's best for your community is challenging, uh, at least. Getting data and numbers to base your decisions on is hard and it takes up substantial resources and is often limited. And what we at Zensity are saying and doing is that local governments don't need to work that hard because the feedback is already out there. People are posting, tweeting, interacting, and messaging uh, about things they care about. So here are some of our clients um, just across uh, Florida and other states in the US. Uh, in 
about our solution, it collects and consolidates all of those interactions, passes them through an algorithm that automatically gives each interaction its own sentiment and category, and then turns that aggregated data into actionable insights to support decision making and evaluate policies. And you're going to hear all about it from our panelists today. So with no further ado, let's get to it. So first up is Tara from Pompano Beach. Now, Tara, what should we know about Pompano Beach so people can get a feel for the place? Yeah, I think you put the perfect photo up there to kind of get a feel for the place, right? <laughs> we are uh, on the east coast of South Florida. Uh, Pompano Beach is located right in between Miami and Palm Beach County. Um, we have about 70,000 um, citizens and we're known for things like our, our cultural arts has been a really big push for us over the course of the last couple of years. And in addition, um, boating, those type of lifestyle activities. Um, I think that as anyone in Florida deals with right now, we're, we're used to constantly having things going on. And that's, that's, that's been our big shift, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, great. So summer is upon us. And that is usually the time for the public event scene to start buzzing. Now, how has the city of Pompano Beach been dealing with having public events with social distancing and lockdowns in place? Well, I think that in Florida, it starts a bit sooner than that, right? So we kind of hit our public events starting in October and November, and then we continue on through with a really busy season until April. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we are, you know, somewhat thankful that as we're coming into summer, the cities don't expect as much out of us, but they're used to, commu the community's used to having people who are coming out and, and they always have something to do. And so in Pompano specifically, I, what we've done is we've created a mixture of um, hybrid events, right? Events that are not specific to um, online or offline, but that we want to not just create things that never existed before, but continue to market the community in really authentic ways that are, um, that, hey, this has always existed, but now we're just bringing it to you in a different way. So for example, um, what you're looking at on the screen right now are four different events, right? So Lyrics Lab is an all, um, an all arts open mic night. We have um, people who sing, people who paint, people who get up and do poetry. Um, and it happens in one of the cultural venues. And what we did is we didn't want to create something new um, because we still want to market Lyrics Lab when it comes back out. We want people to know that there's this amazing program that happens. And so what we've done is we've taken the same host that we always had, and he is doing live Zoom. Um, and I use the term live very cautiously because in Pompano, we've actually made the decision that nothing is live. Um, as a government, you are, we're tied to public record rules and all sorts of other things and going live in areas where there could be the opportunity for somebody to say something that you don't want them to say is never a good idea. So um, we are recording them and creating it as, as a premiere. And those, so once a month, I think it's the second, um, or the third Wednesday, actually, excuse me, the third Wednesday of the month, we take this one hour recording and premiere it. And then everyone who is actually going live with that video is online at the same time so that they can comment and it feels live. We just did that with a music under the stars as well, which isn't up. But um, the picture to the center at the top there is we, as everyone, went under lockdown just before our, um, our Easter egg hunt, which means we had a sugar load of Easter eggs and stuffing for Easter eggs laying around. And we are like, what are we gonna do with this? Um, so we worked with Parks and Rec and we came up with the Rectivity Kit, which is the week before Mother's Day. We knew that a lot of the young kids, they make the crafts that they make for mom at school, those handprint crafts and stuff like that. So we, packaged everything in a to-go kit um, and from and then we went out and the only thing we purchased additional was a Mother's Day craft to pot, to tie into the the bin and within uh, and then we told the community in an unpromoted post that for two hours or three hours we were going to be giving away kits while they lasted all you had to do is drive up so it was a COVID, it was kind of like the way that we're doing uh, food giveaways you drive up, you pop your trunk. We put in the number of uh, kits that you need. 
And within two hours, we gave away 600 kits to our community. Um, And then we turned that around into a promotion where you could promote Parks and Rec and share your photos as well. So Um, I wanted to ask something about, you you said something about the hybrid approach, right? Yeah. Both uh, uh, online and and face-to-face. So could you tell us a bit about the benefits of having that kind of hybrid approach? So the benefits of the hybrid approach are actually great when you look right next to that at Montage. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about a hybrid approach, it's something that happens in real life, right? Um, Well, the hybrid approach also was the the Rectivity kits, but we are able to connect with the community, provide a service, but also educate, expand our reach, right? So the Montage film series is something where it's been a struggle to try. I mean, when there's always something happening in South Florida to try to get people to come out for a film premiere, that's an unknown filmmaker that is going, you're going to get, we, we were getting maybe 20 people that would come out to the audience, maybe. And that was on a, the filmmaker was happy if he was able to come in. So sweet Milady was actually talking about um, the sugar crisis of people in Bangladesh who are, experiencing diabetes at a, at a rapid growth rate, right? So super interesting for most people in the world, right? And totally being sarcastic there. But in, in terms of, um, but it, it's a really powerful film. And just within the Pompano Beach market, you're, you're dealing with a very limited number of people who would actually say, let's go to that. Yeah. So what we were able to do by creating this, we worked with the filmmaker and with the producer of the film, and we were able to screen it on live, screen it live and create an entire, um, a, a digital event surrounding it. So we were able to get email addresses for anyone that signed up for it um, and turn that around into getting the email addresses, getting people to sign up for it. The first event was last month in May. Um, our second events this month, last month, we had 70 people that signed up for the event. This month, we've had 140 people that have signed up for the event. So we are doubling our reach. Now, out of those 70 people that signed up for it, we had over 40 people actually attend and watch the entire event. Um, So we're doing about two thirds of sign up rates. And this month with having 140 people, the filmmaker has actually had to expand their, um, their hosting ability, which to us as a city, we're now reaching people who are going to be able, as we come out of this, think about Pompano Beach as a film premiere location. Um, And really quickly, just 4th of July, many cities are doing the same thing, but we've always had our 4th of July events on the water, right over top of the pier. This year was supposed to be a huge um, spectacular because the pier just was finished. Um, And instead of that, we have COVID and we're certainly not putting um, fireworks off on, a, on just our Eastern district because it would not be fair for, um, for the community in general. So we've now gone with a virtual 4th of July fireworks spectacular from an undisclosed location. So nobody will know where the fireworks are going to be. Um, and we are going to be live. So everyone can see them on our channel 78 and on our website um, and Probably from most places that you live within the city, you'll still be able to see them, but we're not telling anybody where they are. Um, We've had to brainstorm different ways, like, because we don't want people to figure it out as we're setting up barricades. So setting up barricades in different parts of the city to create an illusion that you're going to have um, fireworks there. Yeah. (laughs) So we are, we're we're in top secret mode right now, but uh, we're really looking forward to seeing how this, how this, um, this works out. So you mentioned the beach, actually, and yeah. um, that takes that's a good segue to the next part, which is yeah. you know, things are reopening and uh, slowly, uh, and that presents a lot of challenges. So tell us a bit about you know how you're dealing with those, especially with beaches. So I don't know how many people. Hopefully, none of you remember. Hopefully, it was really short lived, and it's one of those things everyone forgets. But um, at the very beginning of COVID, there was a an entire um, a photo from Pompano Beach where um, spring breakers were still partying because the beach hadn't closed, right? And so, and we were following Broward guidelines, right? We didn't keep it open any longer or close it any sooner. But the problem is we're a beach town. So whereas anybody who 
any city that's centralized that doesn't have a beach town does not have the same problems that any of the beach towns have. So when we open up our beach, anyone who's been tired of st staying at home at any other part of the area is saying, I'm gonna go to the beach this weekend. And in terms of recovery, once COVID's over, that'll be wonderful. But while we're still dealing with a, a pandemic, it's a very difficult situation. So just yesterday, um, the Broward County Commission um, put out a, another release about um, how they will find businesses who are not maintaining a, a mask regulation that they should. But this is one of the areas where Zen City has been super powerful for us, right? So we use Zen City in terms of all right, what are the words that people are saying? What communities are they saying them in, right? So on the um, bottom right-hand side of the screen, you can see that there's the map and we're able to look in that map and see who's talking and is it just one community, that one section of our community that's stressed out about something or is there different keywords that we need to be working, worried about? Um, and then that's how we determine how we're going to communicate. So um, we realized, and the screenshot that I captured isn't the exact same screenshot of why we had the, um, our Pompano Beach Parks open, but mm -hmm. during the time that we were dealing with Pompano Parks and we were in COVID um, and we were getting ready to open, we realized that our, the, the word cloud was showing that people wanted to know, are they open, are they not open? So that helped us create content specific for what are they looking for? They wanna know about tennis, golfing, and boating and they wanna know about parks, right? So we were able to create content based upon analyzing what was being said and then, um, and then build for that. The other thing that we realized is that summer camps were a big um, deal for people. So listening to um, the conversation and what were people doing, we also learned that people wanted in-person summer camps, not as much as they wanted just the um, only virtual options. So whereas we're working with our arts department on virtual options, our parks and rec team created a way to create a socially distant summer camp, which you can see a picture of that down below and you can see kind of how they're working on things from a distance. So um, it's, it's what we found is it's really about the communication. You know, how are we, um, what, do, what is the community looking for and how do we respond to it? Okay. so. Those are great examples, I think. And it also kind of speaks to <clears throat> some of the issues that, which impact a lot of cities in Florida, the fact that tourism is changing now. Um, you know, people are coming and going and you need to take into account those changes. So what, um, what are you seeing in Pompano Beach in terms of how it's changing? Yeah, so um, across the board in any city that I'm working with it's the same thing that we're str that we're struggling with is the um, hotel visitor versus the air the the short-term rental visitor and how what are they looking for right and what they're looking for is they're looking for the opportunity to have space right am i do i have whether or not they want to wear a mask because there's two very divided and and yeah. contentious parts there they even people who don't want to wear a mask want somebody to stay six feet away from them right? Yeah. They want their space around them. And so what we're trying to do is educate people about the, the fact that we have space for you. And we have the, we have room to spread out. So as opposed to showing what used to be really popular was restaurant photos, dining photos, um, people having fun. Now we have to show more of a nature side of things. So we'll show a picture of the beach as the beach is opening in the morning, right? Or we'll show a picture of the beach when people are set up and that shows where that they're set up with space around them. Yeah. Um, we'll show other things that you can do that might not have normally been considered um, part of your vacation, but things like, oh, while you're here, make sure you check out the farmer's garden that we have. Or here's our beautiful new pier and notice that there's not 50 people crowded together on it, right? Yeah. Um, and we're working with some real world items in that as well. So it's you can do things digitally and we can have that communication, but I think the real important consideration is that we are only one small part of the conversation, right? If we say that we're doing all this stuff and then a community member comes out and takes the picture of the five people that happen to be congested in one spot, we have to be aware of that conversation, which is why we continuously listen 
and, and we're able to address those things. You know, those listening tools are so incredibly important at this because all it takes is that one person who's decided that they're on a mission to show just how badly we're doing at social distancing yeah. and, and, and take the pictures of the masks not being on or whatever it might be. Um, and then you have to give them opportunities while they're here. So the picture to the left on the bottom shows something that we did called, um, we've all heard of like the paint and sip opportunities, you know, but um, this is another hybrid example of, it's not just about um, the fact that you have space. People want stuff to do if they're coming to your area. So we created a program where at any point in time, while supplies last and we'll come up with something else after this, you can um, place an order for a paint a, um, a canvas, right? And it's already ready for you to paint. And when you place the order for it, one of our uh, cultural staff will meet you at the cultural center to hand it to you. And then you can turn around and we'll give you a video from a local artist who's going to teach you how to paint this as well. So you're gonna get a digital video with the items that you have in real life that you can um, enjoy. Yes, all, all wonderful. I think the messaging part about like showing people that Here's a space that that's a great you know takeaway for cities to kind of uh, ingest. Um, we have like one more minute before we need to move to the next speaker. Yep. So just so I'll be really quick on this. This is this is a perfect example of it doesn't matter how important we think something is if other people don't care, right? Mm -hmm. So we think it's really important to prepare for hurricane season still, um, especially important since we don't know how I, we have a whole different team that'll have to worry about how people would evacuate, right? Mm -hmm. But um, for us, our messaging is make sure you're prepared. But you can see on the bottom when I showed you how many people was reached and how many engagements were reached on two different messages, um, two separate messages marking the beginning and the end of the disaster preparedness sales tax holiday versus facial coverings, right? Yeah. So it's really important to make sure that you're, yes, you have to get out information. We're dealing with this right now with the census, you know? But the way that we've always gotten it out might not be the way that we're gonna get it out in the future. So, whereas it used to be that we could just post about something, for example, with the census right now, we are running very specific um, demographically targeted ads to demographic markets within our community so that we're able to help them to reach people who, where they are versus knowing that they're not gonna to come to our page unless it's something about COVID right now. Yeah. So that's how I'll wrap it up. Okay. So first of all, thank you. I think those were very, very interesting points. Um, we have, before we move on to Tamara, there was a question that came in during um, your part. Um, and this was the question. How do you feel your residents have responded to the firework change or any change? Can you walk through how you evaluate making these changes? Um. That's above my pay grade for most part, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a better question for the city manager that we have. But I, I will say that um, this, the city is very much, it is brand new. We just announced it yesterday. So um, I'm happy to reply to Yuri with that information once it's over and give, and give him kind of a, a snapshot of how they responded that, he's ha that he can share with you. But um, making those type of decisions was not easy, but it was actually commission driven. Um, there was a specific commissioner who was super supportive of it, and that's how it was pushed through. Okay, great. So thank you very much. Uh, we're okay. moving on to our next speaker, which is Michael Cernich from Tamarack. So Michael, before we start, what should people know about Tamarack to know it a bit? Yuri, we want people to know that Tamarack is a beautiful suburban city in western Broward County, our uh, eastern city limits butt right up against the city of Fort Lauderdale, and our western city limits uh, butt right up against the Everglades. So we, we go from Fort Lauderdale to the Everglades. Uh, we, we, we market ourselves as the city for your life, and we have um, seniors all the way down to, uh, to young families. We're a very inclusive community, and... Uh, we're, we're growing each and every day. So great, uh, thank you for that. Um, so Michael, you've been in this business for quite some time and I think we've, we've never seen anything quite like this whole situation and the, the aggregation of other 
circumstances like with the, the protests and, and the pandemic at the same time and now, you know, all these things one on top of the other. Could you tell us a bit about maybe the opportunity that uh, arises with this kind of these circumstances for maybe speeding up city process? Uh, absolutely, Yuri. And, and before I start, I just wanted to say thank you, Yuri, to you and to Zen City, um, not just for the products that you provide us that we utilize so greatly, um, but really for your commitment to cities as a whole and, and for taking the time to do something like this today. Uh, I know that, that I appreciate it. And I also want to thank Kara and uh, Edwin who are on with us today. Um, Pompano is one of my favorite cities in Broward County. And Sanford is also a, a beautiful city. And you both have tremendous city managers, great leaders in uh, Greg Harrison and Norton Bonaparte. So say hello to them for me if you would. Both great guys. Um, you know, Yuri, as, as the slide says, you know, desperate times call for change. And, and truly, um, desperate times provide us with opportunities. And, and sometimes they force our hands out. I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell the story. Um, but, the, you know, the city of Tamarack had been working on a telecommuting policy for, I'm going to say, the last two years, um, working to kind of catch up with the private sector and to deploy employees you know, at home and to try to reduce our carbon footprint and do all the responsible things that, you know, city really should be doing in 2020. And um, we had a plan for that. It was an 18 month implementation plan. It was nine months of pilot and then nine months of full implementation and then COVID struck. And we realized that we needed to do that in three days. And we did. We successfully took an 18 month implementation schedule and we did it in three days. With, with very few hiccups and very few uh, problems. Now, my, my IT department may have a different perspective on what I just said as far as challenges, but they did it. And that's the point, you know, they came through for our organization. Um, our employees played along, they played their part, they did their job. And the thing that we found from that was um, that not only was it achievable, um, but we're, we're seeing, you know, a lot more productivity uh, from, from people than we ever expected. Um, I think one of the challenges now is going to be bringing some people back to work uh, because people are now used to working at home and they're not going to be able to work from home completely. Um, we're going to have to balance that out. The other thing that we're, have to, we're really going to have to do is uh, come up with some better accountability measures than the ones that we have in place. But for now, people say, how do you judge, you know, the productivity? How, how do you hold people accountable? And I say, well, we have a commission meeting every two weeks and we have agenda items that have to be prepared by deadline. And if people are meeting their deadlines and those items are prepared and the city commission can, can, you know, can consider them, then I, I think we're doing, you know, we're doing all right. Yeah. Um, you know, virtual commission meetings are another story. Everybody has had to do that. You know, we certainly have had to do it too. Um, you know, it, that was initially um, I, probably terrifying for our IT folks, um, but they, they managed it again. You know, they did a great job with it with no, no hiccups. I, we started off, you know, with, with a, a Skype product and we switched to a Microsoft Teams product that we're using now, which we found to be much better. Um, you know, but it, it got it got done so much so that we had our um, we had our budget workshop with the city commission last week, um, and we were actually able to do a kind of a hybrid meeting where we had the commissioners in the commission chamber, appropriately socially distanced. We had staff in there. Um, we were able to make those presentations, and we were able to stream that live and and able to allow people to participate. You know, from from online. Um, with the commissioners actually there. Um, and, and I won't get into all the things that went into that about how we clean the room and how we face people out. And I don't know that anybody really wants to hear about that, but it's just, it, those are the types of opportunities um, that, that, you know, we've had. You, you see a, a, a picture of this uh, handsome man on the screen, our vice mayor, uh, Marlon Bolton. Um, he is emblematic of what we've tried to do in changing um, the way that we communicate with the residents in Tamarack. You know, obviously we use social media like everybody else. We send city products to evaluate our social media success like everyone does. Um, 
but we knew in this situation that people were going to have questions and that we needed to try to proactively answer those questions and then, you know, video is, is such a popular format now. Um, we asked our elected officials to shoot, you know, basically public service announcements, public service announcements about any, any number of things. You know, if residents are, um, if, if they're experiencing food insecurity, there are, you know, food distributions on a certain day. Um, you know, we're having virtual meetings if they're interested in what their government and their representatives are doing. They're having virtual meetings at these times. Um, you know, if they need a COVID test, there's a testing site at the Tamarack, you know, recreation center on University Drive. Um, if they need mortgage or rental assistance, they need to go to our website and fill out the application and get it submitted by, you know, such and such a date. Um, we asked them to explain some of the emergency orders that were issued by the governor and by our county executive and by myself. Um, and we asked them to, to, you know, just give some messages of general hope to the community to say, hey, we're, we're here with you. We're, we're listening. You know, we, we want you to know that, that here, show some compassion for the community. And our elected officials really came through for us on that, Yuri. Yeah, that, that, that sounds wonderful. I think the, the, you know, the fact that you managed to do that so quickly is very uh, thought provoking for, for future processes. Uh, I also wanted to talk a bit about, so we heard from Tara a bit about leisure activities and public events. Can you tell us a bit about what has happened in that area in Tamarack? Absolutely, Yuri. You know, just as, as Tara described, you know, all, all cities provide these great services, particularly through parks and recreation. And that, that for us has become such a vital component in our community because of the because of the extreme demographics that we have, the seniors all the way down to our, you know, kindergarten kids, um, we have a, a really wide variety of programs and offerings that, that uh, you know, we provide to the community. And, and Tamarack is not a wealthy community. It's a solid, middle-class, blue-collar community. Everybody works or, or they're retired. And so um, we have to be able to provide programs and services in a way that, that meets people's expectations and is also affordable. And we've been very successful with that. Um, this challenged that greatly because our facilities were closed. Our, our community center was closed. Our recreation centers were closed. Our playgrounds were closed. The, the, the exercise equipment in our park, you know, were, were fenced off. The basketball courts, tennis courts, everything that everybody uses here in South Florida, they were all closed. And you know, as, as we, we saw people go outside and walk and run and ride their bikes, we said that's great, but we, our parks people said, hey, look, we need to continue to innovate in this instance, and we need to get some of these programs back up and running. So um, we, we adopted what I call the Peloton model, where a lot of the fit classes and, and things that we, um, that we provided, we simply taped them and we put them online virtually for people to participate in their, uh, you know, in their living rooms. We, we have a, a gentleman who's done aerobics classes in Tamarack for probably as long as I've worked here. And I'm gonna date myself, but Norman, you know, has nothing on, uh, or Jane Fonda, I guess, has nothing on Norman. You know, Norman, Norman is, is, I think, 75 years old and he does, he does aerobics classes twice a day, five days a week at our community center. And he packs 100 people in there every time for every class He's, he's kind of a legend and people need their Norman. So we put Norman online, you know, we took Norman virtual and let people experience Norman from home. And the funny thing about Norman is it, it started out as, I'll call it senior aerobics, even some people using chairs. That picture that you see on the screen is from one of his classes. Now you've got all, all ages of people in Norman's classes. You know, he's, he's kind of a legend and, and people need him. Um, one, one other example of, of, of something like that is that in, in January of this year, we started a very important partnership with Broward College. And we, we set up sites at our, at our facilities for Broward College to provide classes um, and workshops for our residents in our community. Um, workshops focused on improve, improving their computer skills, um, improving their marketability for employment, helping them with, with, with skills that would, you know, promote them in, in their lives and professionally. 
and and that all came to a screeching halt. And it was it was really disappointing to so many people that we had to go back to Broward College and say, hey, we've got to figure out how to do this virtually. So help us do this. We'll, we're we're we've got skin in the game here. We're willing to participate. How can we make this work? And because of the strong partnership that we have with Broward College, they came through and we were able to get those classes back up and running in a virtual environment for all of our residents who, uh, you know, who, who wanted to take advantage. Um, we, we talked a little bit of, go ahead, Yuri. No, no, I, sorry. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, one of the things um, that with, with everything that's happening and the fact that uh, you're doing all of these efforts and, and still another thing amounts to another. And, and now we've have hurricane season coming up. I was wondering, you know, if that, if that makes any difference, and we heard a bit from Tara, but this whole change in, in the way the city goes about doing things, is that also getting to the, the way you manage crisis management? Yes, absolutely, Yuri. And, you know, I, I told you when we talked leading up to this, uh, you know, to this program that, you know, <laughs> given everything that we've experienced this year in 2020, Given, given COVID, given the, given the civil unrest um, with, with everything that's going on, you know, regarding police, um, you know, it, it's, it's inevitable that we will have a hurricane in Broward County this year. It just seems like it's, it's, it's a given that we will have a hurricane. And so we've, we've said, okay, we really, understanding COVID and understanding our response to that and still what's happening with COVID, what are we going to do as far as a hurricane should be? Should one happen? Um, and, and I'll say this, and, and I'm, I'm sure that, that the other panelists will agree, you know, because we go through six months of every year looking at, at the weather and being concerned about hurricanes, um, we, we have some really good planning models in place for crisis management. So, you know, we're, we're prepared for a crisis and the, the hurricane model that we use for crisis management applied very, very well to COVID, it's just gone on a lot longer than a, a hurricane preparation and recovery typically does. And so we've been able to use that um, with, with COVID, but what we learned with COVID now into being prepared for a hurricane is that we, we can't have um, the, the people that we typically would have all crowded together in an EOC like you see in the picture on the screen. We have to create a different environment for people to uh, be able to do, you know, their jobs in the EOC and to be deployed at our different facilities throughout the community as we prepare for a storm, wait it out, and begin to clean up. So really what we did was we, we stepped back and we said, okay, we, we have this whole philosophy about who needs to be where and what people's jobs are. And I'll use myself and my executive team as, as the, probably the best example. You know, we, we have this thing that has gone on for the 19 years that I've worked here, where if we activate the EOC and a hurricane is coming, all the department directors come to the EOC and we camp out for a few days because that's what we do. And when we evaluated that last month, we said, okay, there's not room for everybody, not appropriately socially distanced. We can't share rooms anymore. You know, we can't share desks the way that we have. Um, okay, we got to throw out, you know, the tradition. We have to throw out the fact that everybody's got to be here, which half the people hate. And, you know, let's decide really who's essential and who isn't. And when I say that, I mean, who needs to be here and who's just here because they're a department director and it's expected that all the department directors be here, you know? So we just made some decisions about, okay, who's essential, who needs to be in the EOC, who doesn't need to be in the EOC? And, and frankly, why have we been dragging people in here for the last 15 years unnecessarily? Um, it's just allowed us to, you know, really take a step back and think about the, the, you know, the allocation of our resources and the deployment of those resources. And, and is it necessary? Is that the of, of people, you know? Um, yeah. One that, the, yeah we're just, no, go ahead. just to wrap up, Yuri, because I know we have to move on. You know, one of the one of the things that this COVID crisis has really caused me to do is something that we typically do during our strategic planning exercises, 
you know, we, we asked ourselves some questions. You know, we say, what do we do well? And we say, what don't we do well? You know, we asked, you know, what are the things that we need to say yes to? And we also asked ourselves, what are the things that we don't need to do anymore? And I think that, at least for me, COVID has really reinforced that, that, you know, as a city manager, I have to look at our organization and say, what do we do well? And, and how can we improve on that? And if we don't do things well, are, are we not doing them well because we're not committed to them? Or are we not doing them well because they're not necessary? And people, and because they're not necessary, people aren't committed. And so, you know, are there things that we should be saying yes to that we're not because we never have, or because we have a policy that says that's not right, you know? And then, you know, what are the things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing anymore? And, and are we willing to take some risk, understanding that, you know, we might not be successful, but if we're not willing to take risks in improving our situation, and trying to remake local government in the light of a crisis like this, are we even doing our job? And I would say we need to be able to take those risks in spite of, you know, what might be some failure and, and really try to remake our, our, our organizations and take a different approach than we've taken. I think that's, you know, a, a kind of a big picture takeaway from the, from the COVID pandemic. Yeah, I think that's really valuable also because, you know, when, once you're in a, um, once you're in a routine, it's hard to break from that, and and uh, and that force is stronger than than any force of change usually. And um, keeping those kind of fresh eyes is is super super crucial uh, in my point of view. So thank you very much for that, Michael. If there are any questions, um, I don't I don't think we have some yet, but we can move in the meantime to. Uh, Edwin, and if they come up, we have time at the end as well. So, Edwin, what should we know about Sanford to get a feel for it? Yeah, so uh, Sanford is a city with a population about 60,000. We're about 30 minutes uh, northeast of Orlando, so kind of right between Orlando and Daytona um, on the St. John's River. Um, a lot of our history is tied to the St. John's River with paddle boats, um, tied to the citrus groves, um, and even at one point our city was called Celery City for a while um, after the Great Freeze ruined all the crops of the citrus and we had to plant celery to get by. Um, so we've got a great little historic downtown area and river walk that's really built up considerably over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a great little, little town to come visit. Okay, great. So we heard from Michael about the move to telework. Now, could you tell us about the transition you did in the, in the, uh, the transition you did to digital services and how that new normal kind of looks like? Yeah, um, actually very similar to uh, Michael's experience. Um, I'm still relatively uh, new to the uh, public servant environment, having come from Microsoft. Um, I've been in my role for about six months, uh, so most of it has been spent during this COVID crisis. Uh, but very early on, uh, our directors realized that we needed to start getting the ball rolling in preparation in case of a shutdown. Uh, so we quickly compared multiple different telecommuting applications uh, and decided to pick one that was very accessible, that people could pick up without having a ton of training. Um, so we decided to, uh, first of all, ensure that everybody who could work remotely had a working VPN set up on all their devices. And then we very quickly deployed Ring Central as our uh, telecommuting platform. Um, so this platform basically replaced the daily conversations that uh, you would have while working in close proximity to other employees at City Hall uh, and allowed us to continue having our regularly scheduled media, uh, internal meetings. Uh, as soon as we did shut down, we had already kind of done that foundation building and allowed us to, uh, you know, continue business as usual, albeit now digitized. Um, so we used Ring Central to send out invitations for meetings with non-employees, such as vendors, um, and as Michael had said uh, as well, to host uh, some digital commission meetings to continue to uh, involve the public and give them the uh, the opportunity to attend those meetings. Um, so we actually have uh, renewed our in-person commission meetings, but at this point now, the precedent and the processes have been established 
So at this point, we have kind of established that hybrid system where we're going to continue uh, presenting it both in person and digitally to uh, allow a, a greater access uh, for, for more people to be able to participate, uh, which is super awesome. And kind of the main focus that I've had coming from Microsoft into the city of Sanford, and that's that digital transformation. So now that we've done the work, we want to keep doing that going forward. Uh, we've also uh, had to make some changes to uh, like our bidding process, which up until the coding, uh, the COVID crisis was entirely on paper. Uh, so we had to get DocuSign set up and processes available for people to bid digitally and electronically. Um, and now, since my position is actually tied into the finance department, um, hearing them talk about it, uh, they never want to go back. Like we've, uh, you know, changed the, the processes and made it way more streamlined for them as a digital process, save them a ton of desk space with all the paper that they, you know, originally were collecting. Um, and now... Uh, the entire city is kind of starting to move towards this. Okay, well, now how can we start looking at these other processes and start making them, you know, a digital transition? Um, I'm also very excited as a previous Microsoft employee uh, that we are going to be also rolling out that Microsoft Teams application as a collaboration tool. Um, I lived on it for the entire time I was with Microsoft, um, and it's just an incredible opportunity uh, for the city to kind of get on board with the, the different uh, productivity and efficiency uses of teams. Uh, and I look forward to training the entire city on that when it does roll out. Okay. Um, so actually, Sanford is the only one of our uh, cities today in this, in this webinar that is not uh, in Broward. So, mm -hmm. and that means you're in a different position in terms of reopening. Absolutely. So could you tell us a bit about some of the measures that you're taking to make sure that the city is reopening safely? Yeah, so um, we have uh, entered our phase two of reopening. City Hall officially reopened on uh, uh, June 1st, um, but the city has taken great precautions to protect both the employees and the visitors that we have. Um, we have implemented a phase return to work, uh, so we have rotating schedules to try and limit the number of face-to-face -face, uh, interactions that employees have. Human Resources has uh, consistently provided us with the various PPE to employees to ensure that everyone is safe with masks, hand sanitizer, gloves. Um, we've also, anywhere where the public would interact with a city employee, we've installed a plexiglass wall, as you can see here, uh, on the picture to the right, uh, and also installed uh, or put up stickers and tape on the ground to ensure social distancing. I think one of the um, best things that we've implemented at the city of Sanford is the IT department has um, created this COVID self-monitoring form. Um, and every single day, all employees are responsible for filling out this form first thing. Um, it, you select your name from a drop-down box. You uh, say whether or not you've had contact with anyone who's tested positive for COVID. And then there's multiple symptoms that it uh, asks you if you've uh, shown any symptoms of them. And uh, it also m measures whether or not you're teleworking, which is a great resource for all of the, uh, for human resources and all the directors to kind of enforce everybody filling this out every single day to keep that conversation going. Um, but we've also now set the precedent uh, of having this digitized way of getting direct feedback from all of our employees instead of just sending out an email blast and hoping that we get responses. Uh, so this COVID form is, has been a really great tool that IT worked really hard to get uh, out to everybody. In the, really interesting. And, and I think that's um, also something that a lot of cities can kind of, you know, when reopening hits, that's something that everyone will have to face at some point or another. Now, we heard some of the digital measures that, or digital services that the cities, uh, from Michael and Tara, uh, that their cities are offering uh, in terms of leisure. Could you tell us a bit about the services, the digital services that you're doing in terms of economic development? Yeah, so uh, one of the ways that we utilize Zen City during the shutdown was through the weekly analysis of the Zen City insights around sentiments of discourse, uh, specifically focusing on our small businesses. So as I pointed out over the last 10 years, we've had a considerable growth in our downtown with a lot of new businesses opening up. 
um, and it's just been a really incredible couple of years for us. Uh, so this kind of stopped a lot of the momentum that we had as we faced the shutdown. Um, so uh, we actually, utilizing these Entity Insights, we saw that our small businesses, uh, you know, were considerably, uh, you know, stressed and concerned about how this shutdown was going to impact them. Uh, so utilizing SurveyMonkey, we actually created a uh, COVID shutdown uh, survey that we sent out to everybody to find out how it was impacting their businesses. Um, once we got the data collected, we sent that to the Department of Economic Development um, and we were able to determine the needs of our community, send out resources for paycheck protection uh, and grant requests, as well as updated information as we started our phase reopening. Um, we took that information and um, one of the things that we did to help those businesses open up and accommodate as many visitors as possible was we lifted some of the restrictions that we had on sidewalk space in order to allow restaurants to uh, put more tables with outside seating and spread them out to accommodate that 50% uh, capacity and the social distancing guidelines, which was really, really great. Uh, on the, the positive side of it, though, was that Zen City uh, showed us how well our community really came together during this time. Um, you know, er, er, we had certain groups uh, through social media who would post the daily, here are the menus of uh, takeout options that you have. Uh, our distillery uh, transitioned all of their supplies into making hand sanitizer instead of their spirits. And then they, uh, they offered uh, promotions where if you picked up curbside takeaway at any of our restaurants, uh, you would get this hand sanitizer for free and stuff like that. They also donated a ton of supplies and meals to first responders. Uh, so Zen City kind of helped us get this pulse on how the community came together. And it was really, really great to see uh, that everybody was working together to, to get through this crisis. Awesome. Um, I also, you know, reopening also has implications for public spaces, and uh, we heard a bit about that. But um, I wanted to, to ask again, what what services are you doing in, in Sanford, and how you're you're using data to support those? Yeah. So Yuri actually uh, pointed me towards an amazing blog po <laughs> blog post that Zen City produced uh, that I highly recommend everybody uh, take a look at. It was titled "Green Space, Safe Space: How Cities Are Managing Park Space in This New Normal." Um, and I forwarded that information along to my Parks and uh, Rec Department. Um, and you know, reading through that kind of gave us some good ideas on you know making sure that we posted. Um, you know, any type uh, signage to ensure that we're reminding everybody of social distancing and, uh, you know, suggesting that everybody wear a mask. We don't have a mask mandate at the moment in Seminole County. I know that Orlando and uh, Orange County has enforced one, but Seminole County hasn't yet. Um, but we also recognize the significant value that these areas hold to our citizens during times of quarantine and social distancing, giving them a place to get out of the house and you know, enjoy the Florida weather for what it is, you know, before it rains at 2 p.m. or we get this sandstorm from the Sahara that's supposed to be over us the, in the next two days. Uh, so, you know, reading that blog, blog post kind of gave us some perspective on what we wanted to do. Uh, our splash pad just reopened, but we've maintained that at 50% capacity. We've still uh, not uh, opened up pavilion rentals yet uh, because we know that that's kind of a opportunity for gatherings. Uh, we obviously uh, canceled both our Memorial Day and Fourth of July parades in order to reduce those large crowds. And even our historic baseball stadium um, hasn't opened back up yet, but will open back up in July uh, with 50% uh, capacity. Um, and before, before we continue with that, we just have like a few more minutes. So I want yeah, to- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's fine. As well. Um, so we talked about um, a lot of these different changes and I also want to talk about, you know, the opportunity of introducing or inducing fundamental change. So Michael talked about that in, in, in a managerial kind of point of view. Could you tell us a bit about how your role works in the city and how you, you kind of push this kind of process as well? Yeah, absolutely. So my role is relatively new uh, for the city. I only had one pres uh, uh, predecessor before myself. Uh, and it was created by uh, Mr. Bonaparte, our city manager, in order to help make data-driven decisions across the organization. Um, he always tells everybody that he's confident that his people are doing the best job that they know how to. 
Um, and that it's my job to find all the things that other cities know that we don't know to try and uh, help us be more efficient. Um, so uh, as a result, my role is kind of the instigator of change here at the city of Sanford. Um, I work closely with all departments uh, to collect data to help them make informed decisions to improve the efficiency in which the city is running uh, and ultimately save the city time and money. Uh, so I'm hoping to create kind of a growth mindset here at the city of Sanford. Uh, and that means accepting that there's always opportunities to improve. And just because we've always done something a particular way doesn't mean we shouldn't reevaluate as times and business needs change. And 2020 is the perfect example of times and business needs changing. Uh, so, you know, we participate in the Florida Benchmark Consortium, which uh, lets us kind of compare metrics with other cities across the state of Florida. Um, and, you know, Zen City is one of the platforms we use to collect data. Um, and we present that visual story to our departments and citizens um, by leveraging that data. Uh, you know, I work closely with uh, communications officer, parks and rec and economic development departments uh, to make those informed decisions about our interactions with the community. So uh, although unfortunate, this crisis has forced Sanford's hand uh, and kind of made, started our digital transition while focusing on streamlining our processes, so. Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's, you know, that's a silver lining, I guess, in this, in this situation. And this is something that I think pretty much all cities should be taking away from this crisis, right? That this is a crisis, but there's a lot of opportunities to make this kind of change. And you all stated wonderful examples of how to do that. Um, so I think we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, I wanted to, first of all, really thank all of you. It was really a pleasure learning from you and you gave us great uh, practical tips, deeper understanding, and a lot of inspiration. Uh, if there's any other questions that people have, they're welcome to post them in the chat. Um, and it, we'll give it a, a minute or so to, um, to come up and answer. In the meantime, um, I, there are some resources that you can also access. So, Edwin talked about the blog post. We have our blog and there's a lot of wonderful reports in there uh, in terms of how to use public spaces, how to adjust your messaging for census during COVID-19, uh, best practices on various different issues in the context of, of, uh, of COVID-19. But there's also uh, for our clients, we have daily digests on COVID-19 and project dashboards and community of champions, which is a group where we also exchange data and the help center. Um, other than that, I think this webinar is, all of these kind of um, examples is exactly why we do these conversations with local government leaders. We know you're on the front lines and uh, giving us this time and all these valuable lessons, I think is, uh, is, is amazing that you're doing this. And, um, thank you again for, for your participation. John. Okay, so I think we don't have any other questions, but again, I think there were great examples here and thank you so much for, uh, for, to all of you, to Michael, Tara and Edwin, um, and for all the other listeners, have a great day. And um, the recording of this uh, webinar will be available in our website and we'll be sending it out to all the registrants. So you can uh, rest assured that you'll have all the great takeaways from here available to you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye now. Thank you all. Bye-bye.